From the library of the New York Stock Exchange at the corner of Wall and Broad Streets in New York City, you're inside the Ice House, our podcast from Intercontinental Exchange on markets, leadership, and vision in global business. The dream drivers that have made the NYSE an indispensable institution of global growth for over 225 years. Each week, we feature stories of those who hatch plans, create jobs, and harness the engine of capitalism. Right here, right now at the NYSE and at ISIS 12 exchanges and six clearinghouses around the world. And now welcome Inside the Ice House. The streets in front of the New York Stock Exchange have sprung to life over the past few weeks with businesses and tourists returning for the first time since really the summer of 2019. ICE has rolled out the welcome mat with the summer series that offers entertainment, music, and food to everyone visiting Lower Manhattan. Looks can be deceiving though. While the millions of visitors to the building have been missed, business has been humming along for months and now we have the stats to prove it. New listings raise $68.5 billion, both all time records for any six month period in the history of the exchange. And the exchange has also more than doubled its all-time count for direct listings with Roblox, NYSC ticker RBLX, Squarespace, NYSC ticker SQSP, and ZipRecruiter, NYSC ticker Zip, of course. We've also seen 16 SPAC business combinations with $60 billion in enterprise value coming to fruition and listed 111 new blank check companies. Our guest today, Craig Clay, is president of Global Capital Markets for DFIN, the firm that serves as the wingman for many of these transactions and so much more. Their job, to make sure investors, companies, and regulatory bodies have all the information they need to safely navigate the markets. Our conversation with Craig Clay on DFIN's role in supporting all the compliance needs to grow a startup from an idea to a publicly traded unicorn, bringing automation and technology to reporting, and the current state of SPACs, that's right, after this. Historical data can offer insight into the direction of markets. Yet data processing, collection, and storage can be challenging and costly. To simplify your data access needs and help find efficiencies, we launched ICE Data Vault, a cloud-based platform that enables you to access tick history for global exchanges, as well as our proprietary data, sourced from our real-time feed. Backtest your trading strategies to assess performance and viability. Conduct transaction cost analysis and support compliance requirements. Input data into surveillance systems to help detect and prevent abusive or illegal trading activities. Access over 10 years of deep tick history across asset classes. Get tick data for an entire market or on an underlying list of instruments. Access additional securities as needed with flexible delivery options to complement your workflow. Simplify your historical data management with ICE Data Vault. Craig Clay is the president of Global Capital Markets for Donnelly Financial Solutions, NYC ticker DFIN, a role he's held since the firm spun out of RR Donnelly five years ago. Prior to his current role, he served as the senior vice president leading the global capital markets and legal process outsourcing business for R.R. Donnelly. He began his career as a leading financial analyst for American Eurocopter. Craig, welcome inside the Ice House, and thank you for joining us. Thank you very much, Pete. It's great to be here. Uh, No better description than wingman for the capital market. So I think that's the the best way you can summarize uh, Donnelly Financial Solutions. Perfect. It also went well with your your early career in in the uh, aerospace industry. (laughs) That's right. In the intro, I highlight some of the numbers, including the SPACs that began listing this year at an unprecedented rate before suddenly running out of steam. We're talking today fresh off the 2021 SPAC conference. What are investors, sponsors, and service providers like yourself feeling about the space going into the second half of the year? Many say SPACs rescued Wall Street from the COVID doldrums of 2020. And this sort of backwards IPO has is, is really taken you know taken over the market from a perspective of the 160 billion in dry powder that SPACs have raised and they're looking for transactions it's created you know and really revitalized i think so many parts of the capital market you mentioned some of the ipo listings it, it i think also bolsters the entire 
process of raising capital, whether you're doing that in an IPO, a direct listing, whether you're raising a SPAC and considering them being acquired by that SPAC and a DSPAC. Um, it's revitalized uh, the public company, you know, numbers in this country. If you think about the second half of 2021 and then beyond, it's going to be more of the same. Has there been a, a pause? Has there been some indigestion? Yes. Has the SEC been looking uh, more closely at these SPACs? You know, we can delve into that, whether it's warrants, whether it's warning against celebrity SPACs. I think that's great because it means that the SEC is legitimizing um, and bringing confidence and transparency, which to your original question only means that uh, we'll continue to see it be a very strong part of the capital market. You mentioned the celebrity aspect, and I thought it was interesting. Sort of the, the story of 2020 was in many ways SPACs and crypto, both of which have had this sort of celebrity influence, but really come from different places. You know, the SPAC, while it's trendy, is actually was considered sort of a an inside Wall Street style transaction and really outdated a way to tap the market. So what about it really took off, not only the pandemic, but we were starting to see it really in 2019. You know, as you mentioned, SPACs or special purpose acquisition corporations have been around since the 90s. They're also referred to as, as blank check companies. They were the, the last stop on many companies' road of raising capital. It was the, the tool of last resort. That's all completely changed. Um, it now has been, you know, a vehicle whereby investors are getting democratized access to late stage venture companies. And previously, all of this wealth had been going to credited investors, qualified purchasers. So it, it's also allowing us as individual investors, the SPAC structure allows us to participate in later st stage rounds that had you know, sort of heretofore been reserved for VCs. So it, it, it's not just, you know, sort of a, a company or a SPAC buying an established company. It's also SPACs really investing from a perspective of life sciences, from technology that's nascent. It really is, you know, in, in every way, the democratization and sort of the opening up to Main Street, the investing returns that had, had not been available to them. One of the things we've seen is is not only the number but the size. Uh, one of one of your clients, actually, Bill Ackerman, launched Pershing Square Tontine Holding, which is a four billion dollar, as you said, blank check company. Do you think these larger spacs are anomalous of the amount of pent up money in the investment market right now, or is this a trend you expect to see continue? I think we will see it continue because you know the Fed is is committed to the current policy and into the future. I think as well. For the reasons I've mentioned, I think it, it's changed the perspective of a SPAC and the opportunity of a SPAC. And I think we'll continue to see that be an active part of the capital market. So a couple of other little things you touched on, celebrity SPACs. So you've got Shaquille O'Neal as a SPAC. Today in the news, Commerce Secretary Robo Ross you know, was talking about he's targeting more in, in the small company from a, from a DSPAC DPA, perspective. You mentioned Bill Ackman, you know, his $4 billion SPAC. An interesting thing there that he's using it in a different way. And he coined the term Spark, uh, which is Special Purpose Acquisition Rights Company, which is just getting another sort of asset you know, classification for people to have the rights to, to acquire it at a later date. So I, I think it continues. I think the celebrity aspect, well, you can be warned about it. You know, typically these celebrities are partnered with terrific management teams. I think it's helpful. It brings attention to it. So you mentioned the Spark, which a Bloomberg article described it as, and this is a quote, extremely complex, but a kinder model for investors. I mean, is this just a creative way for him to spend $4 billion or are we seeing the next sort of sea change in the space? For me, I think the, you know, Bill Ackman sort of twisty, not exactly a SPAC kind of deal. What it shows is the awesomeness of the capital market. It's efficient. He's using the SPAC tool to raise money and then deploy that in the way that he believes he can drive investor return. Um, so I think it's it's creative. I think to me, what it says is you'll likely see other sort of different use cases or sort of edge cases. The rights offering, you know, could could take off. So it could be a, an instrument that you start to see 
in other SPACs, especially given the SEC's comments on, on warrants. And then we've also seen uh, SPACs uh, start to target assets that are within a company. So a SPAC and spin, uh, where they're actually buying a business unit, you know, sort of unlocking the value. Donley Financial, DFN was spun out of our Donley in, in 2016. Conceivably, that could have been spun out into a SPAC versus um, spun out as a standalone company. Going back to the, the SPAC conference I started on, you know, it actually featured the New York Stock Exchange's own Jenny Dong on a panel about exactly what you just said, this idea of using a SPAC to spin out a division or even take a, a previous acquisition and relaunch into the public market. How does that make the transaction more attractive to the company? In, in many respects, compared to an IPO, the SPAC is much less risky for the company. So you're signing a deal with just one person, the SPAC sponsor, for a fixed amount of money, You know what's in the SPAC pool at a negotiated price. Um, and then you sign and announce the deal that probably gets done, period, off to the races. With an IPO, which I was involved in, you announce the spin, uh, you start negotiating the size, the price, you know, the the card out, uh, you don't know until after it's announced uh, and start marketing if things are going to go right or wrong, if it's going to be successful, an embarrassment. That, that same thing is true for just a private company considering being acquired by a SPAC or, or going public. Um, it's just a, a very different road. The SPAC can be three to four months, whereas in the traditional IPO can be a year, certainly sooner and, and longer. Um, so the timelines are, are very different. So I think for the type of asset, the very first asset to do a SPAC and spin uh, was Gore, Gore's holding agreed to merge with Ardon's uh, metal unit, which is the, they make cans for LaCroix and White Claw. So Gore's, which is certainly a serial SPAC you know, company, and we're blessed to work with them and have a great relationship being being their wingman, they pioneered did the first one. And, and you look at that and it's, it's it's sort of a very traditional business unit, right? They make cans. And I think that too, you could see, you know, sort of these very traditional sort of old world versus technology business units, likely unlocking value and having greater value as a standalone than they did as a part of their parent company. Speaking of unlocking value, to go back a little bit for Donnelly Financial, you mentioned it's a spin from R.R. Donnelly. I believe it took about a year between announcement and spin. It's a little bit longer than you would have with a SPAC combination. But I was reading back some of the media coverage from five years ago, and it described the Donnelly Financial section as, and this is another quote, the smallest but the real crown jewel among the three new entities. What was the decision behind splitting up R.R. Donnelly, one of the longest listed companies in the New York Stock Exchange, I should add. And what part became what we now call DFIN? I don't know who wrote that. I, I certainly would um, would agree. Uh, it was it was a gem. I mean, look, you had a wonderful historic company, R.R. Donnelly. I worked there. Um, I started my career in this business unit, which was Donnelly Financial. Uh, so I was a part of this group throughout the time I was at R.R. Donnelly. It, it was always, you know, very technology driven, you know, very much driven on our virtual data room, our investment in AI, which happened while we were still a part of our Art Only, our tools such as active disclosure, where we're driving sort of collaboration and filings. Uh, so our sort of DNA was always very different from, from the beginning. It, it did start as financial printing. So you know, decades ago, we used to print many, many books and distribute them, whether they were proxies or M&A or, or IPO documents. Um, it's, it's, you know, birth was out of the print DNA of, of R. Donnelly. So, you know, if you go back to the original announcement, it was about unlocking value. It was allowing the three groups to specialize. And I think you see, certainly you can look at how defense done over that journey. Um, and it's been a journey, you know, so you're put out, you know, in the public markets, uh, you have a lot of work to do. But, you know, if you look at our latest earnings call and earnings results, uh, we're really proud of the work we've done with continuing to drive software revenue, recurring revenue, paying down debt. You know, we're really proud of the work that we've done since October 2016. How do you take that experience and then translate that when you're talking to some of your clients today looking to do either a similar spin out or some other kind of complex transaction? 
Yeah, I think it allows us to talk, you know, with uh, empathy <laughs> that we've been there, we've been through the process, you know, it can, it, it's very rewarding, it's very stressful. We use our own tools, right? So you have collaboration, and version control and security and distribution and roadshow and investor calls. I mean, it is a pretty intense process. Back to the, the comment of wingman, you need sort of the flexibility of having a company whose sole focus is helping shepherd you through this in that you don't have all of the people and the staff to have this be seamless. We operate 24 seven, our people, our service, our technology, we have regulatory experts. Um, so it's, it's both a technology backbone as well as a service team and people who know that this has to happen before that. And, you know, you have, you know, two hours on this and, you know, these, you know, checklists have to happen before you're on the roadshow. It, it, it's just a very collaborative process that we're fortunate uh, to be able to work with our clients on. And, and it differs between a, an IPO and a SPAC, which is something I wanted to get into. You know, sometimes coincidence and causality can often be mixed up. What we have seen in this SPAC slowdown is the return of the traditional IPO, particularly in technology, which has long been kind of a laggard in, in following that classic roadmap from private to public. Is there a relationship between those two trends or are they just being governed by different forces that just happen to have coalesced? It's all sort of working in concert. I think it does feel very much like the questions being asked of SPACs cause a slowdown, cause indigestion. And then you see the sort of uptick in IPOs in general, and then especially technology IPOs. I, I think that was in process regardless. Uh, I think that those companies aren't looking to be acquired by a SPAC and then making that decision. I think they were on that journey. Um, I think the summer and into the fall, there's a lot of unicorns and sort of big brand names uh, that are lined up that were always intending to be a traditional IPO. I think it's mostly just the, the course that they were taking uh, versus that anything that has to do with, with the SPAC slowdown. And luckily, um, you know, sort of coming out of that, if you look at the numbers from, you know, March to April to May, you know, to, to what we expect to be a full, full year, full month gym and Q2, there is a, a bounce back, albeit not to the Q1 insanity, but to something that I think is more sustained going forward. Whether we're talking SPAC combinations, IPOs or direct listings, which we've not touched on yet, you know, the pipeline is, is primed seemingly for years to come. Is this that turning point we're finally seeing that after almost 30 years of a declining number of public companies that the overall number of public companies will stabilize and then begin to increase? I think it is a change to the number of public companies that we have in, in the United States. I think it's terrific. Uh, I think that, again, it's giving Main Street investors you know, access to more companies, earlier companies. Uh, will there be volatility? Yes. Will there be something that isn't successful, of course? Um, I think on the other side of that, you'll find huge returns in some of these places where people place bets, again, like the VC world where, where bets are placed and, and amazing returns happen. I think you'll see that in technology. I think you'll see it in life sciences. It's just a change in the overall market. And when you think about the you know dry powder that I mentioned, the billions of dollars, you know, potentially approaching trillion in dry powder to acquire companies, uh, you have hundreds of companies that are pending pricing their SPAC. You have hundreds of companies that are already priced and looking. I just think it sets it up, you know, to be a, a terrific sustained change in, in the market. Uh, having been in this business and seen the dot-com bust and the financial crisis, you can always say there's a new paradigm and then, you know, pets.com is gone. So you have to be careful when, when saying that, but I do think there is an opportunity, certainly given the collection of the COVID crisis monetary policy. Well, and that new monetary policy also comes with increased regulatory issues, which after the break, Craig Clay, Defin's president of Global Capital Markets, and I will discuss how his firm helps clients navigate the path from private to public and provide end-to-end -end solutions for their compliance and other business needs. That's all right after this. Now a word from ABB Limited, NYSE ticker ABB. ABB Formula E. It's today, it's the future, and it's electric. Champions will rise, and a single inspired moment can make history. 
For ABB, this is more than a race. It's part of rethinking how we can live, work, move, and produce without consuming the Earth. By bringing great teams together, we create and innovate the technologies that tackle the challenges our world is facing today and tomorrow. We're bringing ABB Formula E to cities around the world to share our vision of driving progress towards a smart and sustainable future. ABB Formula E, more than a race. Welcome back. Before the break, Craig Clay, DFIN's president of Global Capital Markets, and I were discussing how DFIN and the SPAC space has evolved. So ironically, and you'd actually touched on this, you know, as trading became more digital over the decades, the New York Stock Exchange had to open an archive that filled with thousands of boxes, many produced by R. Donnelly of filings and legal forms that were required for every public company to list on the exchange by the SEC. How are you working to automate the SEC filing process and replace those mounds of paper with digitized secure repositories with tools like Venue and Edgar Online. Yeah, I can't imagine anybody has printed paper anymore. You know, and, and the tools that DFEN was, you know, building and, and creating and certainly advocating for our clients to use pre-pandemic and the years before um, active disclosure, uh, which is we have a new version of our disclosure platform that's built from the ground up uh, with our clients' input, uh, we've hit the ground running. You know, it's a cloud-based financial reporting software um, that we think is transforming this regulatory environment um, that you talked about. Everything is within that cloud-based instance. So it's a terrific opportunity to, to make our clients' lives easier, allow them to save time. It links to all of their documents, which are typically output from an ERP. And it saves time, it saves money, it saves the agitation of having to worry about, is this the right number because it's pulled you know, directly from the source. And then it's filed uh, with the SEC and then certainly that's, that's where the exchanges you know, are pulling that information. So it, it's a completely seamless integration you know, that's providing intelligence and, and insight along the way. And one of the things that's happened over the last couple of years, particularly, is the use of virtual data rooms. I was kind of wondering about what, what are your expectations for that? Because on one hand, I think overall, businesses have become more comfortable working in, in a digital environment. But also, sort of the, the impetus for that growth is no longer as pressing. You know, the remote business seems to be dis- diminishing. Most of the financial firms seem to be coming back to either a hybrid or fully in office. Buyers who were looking at an asset certainly were no longer going to a, a physical deal room where they were looking at paper. So that's only now been, I think, completely closed by the, the last 15 plus months uh, during the pandemic. So a virtual data room, and ours is called Venue, is really the only way for companies who are thinking of selling an asset to, to really professionally put it together. And if you think about companies who are considering being acquired by our SPAC or SPACs who are going out, we have many of our clients who will send to those companies they're interested in or the inbound calls where companies are interested in being acquired by that SPAC, they'll send them a you know, contact for defense venue. And here's the, here's the room, here's what we require in that room. Uh, so here's a template of the things that they, as a buyer, would want to review and, and look at. And our venue VDR is different from most. It's the only one that has built-in AI analytics. So we acquired a company called Ibrevia that provides insights into contracts and the documents. Its founders created it because they were m and attorneys. So with this integrated into the VDR, you can get amazing due diligence just with the push of a button. So you can get change of control. You can find out all about their lease obligations. You can look at LIBOR, which is a big hot topic right now as as that looks at changing at the end of this year. So it's speeding the review of it. It's putting things more in the forefront. It's making things more accurate. 
So it, it's just a really great collection of technology to, to power not just the sellers, but also the buyers. You mentioned acquiring Brevia, but in March, you actually announced a partnership to advance the automation of your financial reporting tools. When you're looking to improve a service or a product, how do you determine whether to develop a technology in-house, purchase it like you did Brevia, or partner with another company like you did with Flowcast? It's a great question. I mean, you have to have a strong report card of buy, build, partner. And, and we do. And oftentimes what we go into the market with is really driven by our clients. So we look at our clients who are sort of leading edge and you know using the best of technology and Flowcast, uh, which is the accounting workflow automation tool where we partnered. It, it, it completely makes sense to partner with somebody who's every single day objective is to innovate and make that market better. So they're really transforming this sort of pre and post IPO technology market. We think back to our conversation about what's going to happen in 2021 and 2022, the sort of change in the economy to this new economy. Flowcast is at the leading edge of that. And, you know, one of their clients highlighted is Grubhub. They're using Flowcast. Flowcast is outputting to documents that are linked within Defense Act disclosure. It just creates this seamless suite from their accounting tool all the way to the SEC filings. It gives Grubhub confidence that, again, there's only one source of the truth, that that's in their SEC filings. It's in their formal reporting. So it's board reporting and things that they link um, and distribute internally. It's just this great collection of technology. It didn't make sense for us to build that. It makes sense for us to, to partner with that as our core is really regulatory collaboration on documents, the accounting piece sort of sits on the side of that. The same thing with AI. I mean, eBrevia had made amazing strides and we partnered with eBrevia to see if we could create a collection of technology that benefited our clients. That was working really well. So we invested in eBrevia, continued to work really well, and then we acquired eBrevia. As you're thinking about acquiring, partnering for expertise, one of the things I was, I was wondering about is there's some similarities between transactions, but how did your company ramp up to be that wingman for all these companies that are trying to de as that practice went from really a rarity to the dominant private to public transaction over 2020? And what are some of the successes that you had either early on or, or more recently? The early on successes that we had were around creating this virtual IPO, virtual SPAC, creating the environment where all of this could happen with high velocity and great technology that, that didn't create any pain points for our clients. So the, the technology that we had in advance of the pandemic really was a foundation. Our service team was prepared when this market took off. And then all we had to do was add in a collaboration video tool like Zoom or Teams really whatever our, our clients you know preferred. And we integrated our technology with that. So we would have breakout rooms, collaboration rooms, the collaborative tool that you had on your desktop was then visualized within Teams, within Zoom, and we were off to the races. And in many ways, you know, the work from home environment allowed our team to be more productive. You know, we're big believers at, at DFEN that our team at home and during this pandemic has been immensely productive. We don't need to see our employees to know that they're working because they're producing just such great results for our clients um, and, and great service with our clients. What we've seen this week, just to continue building on that, is we've seen a return to this hybrid. So we have offices across the globe. Our office in New York this week is hosting several different client groups working on various stages of a SPAC or a DSPAC. They're in our conference facilities. We have Zoom boards in the conference facilities. So some people are remote joining on Zoom boards. We have one massive conference room that has Zoom boards lining the entire room. So it's creating this collaborative feel, again, with our technology collaboration tool, Active Disclosure, as well as then uh, Zoom bringing everybody together and some people being physically together. We, we've mostly been focusing on how Defen helps NYC's listed clients and soon to be listed clients navigate going public and meeting compliance standards. But that active disclosure you mentioned earlier is now being paired with a product that would actually help ICE's core energy business. 
What is FERC Pro and how does it automate and ensure compliance in the energy space? We announced, uh, uh, again, a partnership with FERC Pro. We think it was at the, you know, the best opportunity for us to provide your energy clients a, a solution. It takes all of the data. It has an analytics tool. And now companies are having, energy companies are having to report to the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, FERC. So it is allowing this collaboration. It's allowing the necessary tagging of those documents in XBRL. It's cost effective. Again, very similar to reporting to the SEC. It's allowing this collaboration, one version of the truth, allowing a, a precedent library. We're able to see what your peers are doing and comply with this new FERC requirement. You know, our business is helping companies comply, you know, reduce risk, help them be compliant. And this really sets us apart in the energy space. We anticipate that we'll see regulation, you know, continue where we'll continue to provide solutions like that, whether it's ESG, whether it's the Financial Transparency Act, which has uh, currently been reintroduced, which would only accelerate reporting to other agencies. This is going to be, a, 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 again, a permanent change in the marketplace, which provides transparency of how our tax dollars are being spent and as well how companies are reporting to the government. Do you track or have a sense for how much more accurate your tools are able to make companies? I, I read an article you actually wrote back in 2018, in which you cited, I think, 20% of annual reports filed the SEC were kicked out and had to be resubmitted, which is both gets people in trouble with the SEC and also it costs a lot of money. We track our accuracy in XBRL filings, as an example, through a number of third parties. So we are always ranked at the highest level of accuracy. So it's, again, third-party rating us, not deep end. It's our belief that when you, you know, provide great tools that allow transparency and consistency, your accuracy goes up, and, and we've proven that from third-party analysis. You also then get into efficiency. So we're tracking that as best we can. So we publish the efficiency gains on the Brevia side. So we've reduced review time by 67%. Where does that come from? You know, we set up ways of having our clients in the M&A space measure in a sort of pre and post review time or billable hours. So um, it's something that we're very focused on because we think, again, all of this sort of bank-like security, collaboration, ability to do your job faster is all expected. And then how can we show our client that we have the metrics and the proof points to work at DFIN versus a competitor? You've recently announced the launch of Contract Tracer which is aimed at bringing that AI intelligence to small businesses. How does that product work? And is that designed to give the little guy the tools to compete with their larger clients? It is designed to give the little guy access to the same great artificial intelligence that powers large enterprise solutions that they likely don't have access to because they're too expensive. So it is targeted at you know a company that has like 400 contracts. And those could be leases associated with you know, sites where they franchise. It could be employment contracts. It's pre-populated with things that they would be interested in knowing about, uh, lease expiration, contract expiration. So it's, it's instantly making them more efficient and valuable in how they manage their contracts. I mean, these small companies are keeping these contracts on a hard drive or, you know, free service you know, storage tool, not good from a security perspective, and then very manual as far as getting insights and being able to, to manage a business. So it's something that right now is limited to large corporations and how they manage their contracts, and we're bringing it to the small and, and medium-sized businesses. In the five years since you've become an independent company, you've grown, as you've mentioned, what do you see the biggest opportunities moving forward for DFIN? I think our biggest opportunity is that we have the brand permission across, you know, the, the most important documents uh, that companies, law firms, investment banks are dealing with, whether they are transactional in nature, like we've talked about, M&A, SPAC, IPO, or whether they're compliance in nature, a 10Q, an 8K, a proxy, an annual report. We're helping our clients be more efficient in those spaces. Uh, we're helping them collaborate. We're giving them enormous confidence around security. 
But then most importantly, we're helping them with regulatory compliance and risk mitigation. So this year had new rules that were required um, in the 10K for human capital. We're helping our clients know what those rules mean. We're providing them what their peers are doing, and then we're helping them be compliant and file. We see ourselves as replicating that again, whether next year it's ESG, you know, it's another regulatory requirement like FERC. We think we can help our entire spectrum of clients be more efficient, give them confidence and provide them a wingman uh, when they need it, which is someone on their team to shoulder some of that work in these most pressing times. So finally, we began the conversation talking about trends in SPACs. If we have you on in, in, in five years, what do you think will be the biggest story in finance and the capital markets? I think five years ago, I wouldn't have said SPACs. So I, I, <laughs> well, I've been in the capital markets a long time, helping our clients. We've, we've seen a lot. So you, you've seen the instruments of every product and combination be used. I can remember when high yield was called junk bonds. So often things you know that have a sort of bad reputation or, you know, polished off. I think SPACs are in a similar place right now. So I think what we'll see is, I believe, a increase in public companies. I think the technology that we're providing helps companies have it be less onerous, which then allows, I think, the stigma of being public, you know, is difficult and time consuming. I think companies like DFAN and the technology that we're offering can help power you know, the, the capital market in the US to have more public companies and give more access to these companies to Main Street investors. Well, we'll just have to see what happens and have you on in five years. Yeah. Thanks so much, Craig, for joining us inside the Ice House. Thank you very much, Pete. That's our conversation for this week. Our guest was Craig Clay, president of Global Capital Markets for Donnelly Financial. That's NYSE ticker DFIN. If you like what you heard, please rate us on iTunes so other folks know where to find us. And if you have a question or comment you'd like one of our experts to tackle on a future show, email us at icehouse at ice.com or tweet at us at Icehouse Podcast. Our show is produced by Stefan Caprils with production assistance from Ken Abel and Ian Wolf. I'm Pete Ash, your host, signing off from the Library of the New York Stock Exchange. Thanks for listening. Talk to you next week. Information contained in this podcast was obtained in part from publicly available sources and not independently verified. Neither ICE nor its affiliates make any representations or warranties, express or implied, as to the accuracy or completeness of the information and do not sponsor, approve, or endorse any of the content herein, all of which is presented solely for informational and educational purposes. Nothing herein constitutes an offer to sell, a solicitation of an offer to buy any security, or a recommendation of any security or trading practice. Some portions of the preceding conversation may have been edited for the purpose of length or clarity. 